Well, I'm sorry, ma'am, but your bike sucks. Well, wait, you don't have to leave. In the years between our teddy bear and our driver's license, what's our favorite thing? That's right, our bikes. Well, not me, mine sucked. And likely, yours does too. Easy now. It's not your fault, you've been duped. But it's okay, I can get you out of this. I literally tell people their bikes suck for a living. Trust me, I'm a professional. Allow me to explain. When I was 13, after getting my first real bike for my new paper route, I kept pestering the guys at my local bike shop until they let me work there for discounts. After a few years of pouring through the catalogs and ogling those customer bikes, my 1990 Trek 830 Antelope suddenly sucked. So I ordered my dream bike, a 1992 Trek 970. Lighter frame set, anodized rims, faster tires, rapid fire shifters. Wow, what a bike! The day it showed up was the best day of my life. It was actually the first bike I ever built myself. That evening, with all the love in my heart one can have for such a fine machine, I took it out for its first ride, and that ride sucked. <laughs> the racy geometry and long stem had me way over the front of that squirrely front wheel. The saddle was hard as a rock, and the shifting was better, but it still didn't help me finish my route any faster so I could get back to that bike shop to work for free. What happened? I thought 970 minus 830 would make it 140 times better. Why didn't anyone tell me? Had I been duped? And then winter came and I got my driver's license and my dream bike got put on a hook and hung there for 15 years, becoming obsolete and worthless as I pursued an English degree and became a bike mechanic. So here I am, 30 years later after being duped myself by the big biker catalogs, and I'm running my hometown bike shop, hoisting my neighbor's bikes into that same repair stand I learned on, telling them their bikes suck for a living, just so they don't end up like me. I don't want you to end up like me either, so here are the top 10 things I find wrong with your bike. Number 10, it was born in a department store. Yeah, I know, with bikes starting at $500, not everyone can afford a brand new bike from a bike shop. That does not mean the next best option is a brand new bike from Walmart. Those products are made with very low grade materials and components that might be good enough, but probably not. Further, the same kid that just got done stocking the Cheerios assembled that thing in the back room in about 15 minutes on a flimsy stand without any bike tools. I actually kept track once, about 1 in 25 will have the fork on backwards. A refurbished, shop quality used bike will serve you much better in the long term. Number 9. It's too fancy. I have a saying, the only fancy bikes I like to touch are my own. I can count on one hand the number of people that I've met that have the physical ability to eke out the marginal gains provided by an ultralight racing bicycle. Sure, racing drives the innovation in bicycles, which is super fun and interesting, but it doesn't have any real world application to people like you and me. Now I'm 190 pounds. If I'm riding my 21 pound road bike up Lao Tuez at 200 continuous watts, I'll get to the top in one hour, 38 minutes, and three seconds. If I do that on your 16 pound super bike, I'll get to the top 2 minutes and 14 seconds faster. And that's only if I care so much about how fast I'm riding that I don't stop to take any pictures of me riding up Lao Tuez. Run that same experiment 100 flat miles and you're only saving 36 seconds. Please, for the love of God, check my math and post it in the comments. A well-tuned, comfortable bike that suits your purpose is worth 140 times more than carbon fiber bottle cages. Spend the extra money on a nutrition plan and a sleep study if you want gains. And no, I don't sell those. I'm just a bicycle guy. Number eight, and I'm gonna get myself in trouble here. You got too old. Look, I think it's beautiful and amazing that you're still riding your bike. And I remember how you ate little dirtbag bike punks like me for breakfast back in the 80s. Those decades of racing in college, hammering out mega miles in your fast weekly group ride, and training on Zwift indoors all winter have really worked your body hard as a rock. Congratulations, you've officially unlocked the slow bike achievement. It's like retirement, but bikes. 
Unfortunately, your five-year-old carbon road bike is already obsolete and has zero value on the used market. But the good news is your new bike costs about one-tenth as much and it's way better. Number seven, your bike got old. 27 inch drop bar 10 speed friction shifting road bikes for the most part are lost causes. They're just never gonna be right for anything. There's always a better option. It's not unheard of to know somebody that rode their 1972 Schwinn Varsity across the country, but that doesn't mean it's the way it should be done today. Sure, a mountain bike got the job done in 1992, but you're gonna have way more fun riding through the woods on a modern cross-country trail bike. Rock hard 23 millimeter tires on aluminum frames beat the hell out of everybody in the 80s and 90s, but some bikes should just be forgotten forever. Number six, it's your only bike. Yeah, this one's for the N plus one folks out there. There's no such thing as a four wheel drive, turbo diesel, hybrid minivan, and the perfect bike doesn't exist either. Now my 1996 Rivendell all arounder comes really, really close, but I still have a fleet of purpose built bikes to optimize my riding experience depending on my mood. I have a saying, everyone needs a good slow bike, but I also believe in the right tool for the right job. Most of the time for cyclists, that means having more than one bike to scratch all the itches. Number five, it's the wrong size. Way back when, bikes fit pretty big. Then, mountain bikes came around and the geometry changed so they started fitting them a little bit smaller so they were easier to handle in the rough terrain. When these design changes trickled back up into road bikes, all of the old sizing conventions became irrelevant, but people are still measuring seat tubes. We used to measure them in centimeters and then we measured them in inches. I get a lot of people that tell me they need a bike of a certain size designated by a certain number they heard somewhere along the line. But it simply doesn't apply to bike like it does with shoes or whatever. So many bikes are picked up as hand-me-downs or garage sale finds, so so many bikes are just wrong. A lot of the times we can make some tweaks here and there to make it work, but the wrong size is usually the wrong bike. Number four, you're not a big biker. Okay, fine. But you really didn't need to tell me. No offense, but I already knew that. No, I didn't even need you to reinforce the fact by telling me you've never raced or anything like that. This does not mean you belong on a single speed cruiser with pedal brakes. I'm really sorry that the bike industry has you convinced that riding bikes is all about exercise and hard work and being an athlete and fancy stuff, but it's not. You want your bike to be easy to ride, not simple. What you want is a good quality comfort bike with upright handlebars, a comfy seat, and a wide range of gears with one shifter. Yes, those bikes exist, and yes, I love to sell them. I set up all my bikes to be easy and comfortable because most of the time, it's the right bike. Number three, a lack of maintenance. Yes, I'm extremely biased here. The easiest way for me to make money is tuning up and refurbishing bicycles. Regardless, there's rideable and there's right. New bikes work pretty good, but there's always a break-in period. With that first tune-up, we're gonna make all the necessary tweaks now that things have settled in a little bit. And a few thousand miles later, we're gonna replace some brake pads, a chain, a cassette, put on some fresh tires and grips, and that bike is gonna be better than brand new. Bicycles are just like my old Red Wing mock toes. They're always better a few months after a resole. Number two, you are weak. Bikes are uncomfortable and require some physical and mental effort to fully enjoy. If you're not willing to experience a little discomfort or learn a few lessons along the way, there isn't any bicycle that's right for you. I would suggest spending your money on a lazy boy and some life insurance. That said, e-bikes have really changed the game. If you can walk, you can ride an e-bike. I think this is absolutely wonderful. I just don't see why bicycles have to be exercise machines or sports equipment. I believe, first and foremost, that bicycles are fun as hell. I am not a very strong rider either. Just because you're weak doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to have some fun on a bicycle. Number one, your bike is just fine. I've pretty much built my entire life around this concept. Most of my customers come through the door with their bikes thinking their bikes suck. There's just so much messaging out there telling them their bike sucks and it doesn't. Chances are the bike you have is just fine. So I'm sorry to tell you, but that 20 year old comfort hybrid is way better than anything I can sell you new today. I love those things. Let's just tune it up, put some new tires on it so you can enjoy it for another 20 years. Oh, you want it to go faster? Let's try some different tires. Or with a few easy tweaks, that mid 90s mountain bike you had in college is a perfect thing to strap a burly trailer to to haul the kids around the neighborhood. 
It's also pretty common for people to have an unbelievably robust tolerance for inadequacy, which makes anything rideable good enough. I picked up another saying earlier this year, it's good enough for who it's for, and that applies so much to my business. So that's it. I think most of the time we fall in love with the idea of the bike or what kind of rider it's gonna make us. We're just not able to see the reality in front of us. And I know, what do I care? If somebody wants to spend their money on the wrong bike from me, I should just do it, right? Well, personally, I don't think so. With a few exceptions, I don't have any bikes in my shop over $800. Like I said, the only fancy bikes I like to touch are my own, and even those don't look like anything in the catalogs. The head trash is pervasive. I told myself for 25 years I couldn't make a living with a bike shop in my hometown of 7,000 people. It wasn't until I ignored the industry and abandoned cycling culture and just started focusing on practical bikes for practical people that it started to work. So here I am at the end of my seventh season and so far, so good. And another way I'm gonna make it work is with this YouTube channel. So thank you so much for clicking in. If you like this content and wanna see more, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, click the notification bell so you and your bike can stay tuned.